Hi everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Source. I'm your host, Taylor Hudak. The German national election was held on Sunday, September 26th, marking the end of 16 years in power for German Chancellor Angela Merkel. However, it is still unclear what the German government will look like as the Social Democrats won the most amount of seats in the German Bundestag, followed by the CDU or CSU, followed by the Greens. And now the parties begin discussing the formation of a coalition. Joining me now to discuss how this election could possibly impact the future of the German economy, today we are joined by Professor Richard Werner. Professor Werner is a German economist and former investment banker and university professor in banking and finance. He holds a first-class honors degree in economics from the London School of Economics and a doctorate in economics from the University of Oxford. Professor Werner's book, Princes of the Yen, was a number one bestseller in Japan. It has also been created into a documentary that has more than 2 million views on YouTube. In 1995, he coined the phrase quantitative easing, a concept that has become very popular among the central bankers. Professor Richard Werner, first of all, I want to welcome you to The Source. It's a pleasure to have you with us. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. Before we get started, can you explain to our viewers the nature of your work and in particular how you've really challenged the mainstream narratives surrounding the central banks and how the economy works? Well, in a nutshell, what's driving economic growth is bank credit. And there's a reason for that. When banks lend, they actually create new money. And when you inject new money uh, and give it to somebody who's borrowing and spending it, this will have an impact in the economy. So it's actually very simple. Bank credit creation drives the economy. And if banks lend for asset purchases, you're pushing up asset prices, you're getting an asset bubble. If you do too much of that, you're getting a banking crisis. That, in a nutshell, is already my quantity theory of disaggregated credit. And based on that, I propose a new monetary policy. When you have one of these banking crises, how to get quickly out of it, the central bank can quickly step in, uh, take the non-performing assets off the bank balance sheets um, and get bank credit going again. And I call that quantitative easing. Now, what the central banks who seem to love this expression uh, I proposed it in 1995 back in Tokyo. Um, but what central banks made out of this is slightly different. And I'm not entirely um, happy about how they have implemented QE, but it's certainly um, become part of the official central bank narrative. Whereas bank credit creation is only recently being recognized by central banks as being an important variable. So that's taken a bit longer. And you provided the first empirical studies to prove that banks actually create money, correct? That's true. Um, it, it used to be just one of three theories of banking. Uh, and the currently dominant one is the financial intermediation theory, which says banks just, you know, the intermediaries like other non-banks as well, financial institutions, they just gather deposits, then do their analysis, then they lend money. And so they don't have much of an impact. That was what, that's the dominant theory. But I did an empirical test and that's proven wrong. That's not what happens. And banks actually create new money and therefore they are very, very different from other players and they are very important. They are really the central um, lynch economy and therefore you have to look at banking policies, you have to look at bank credit to understand what's happening in the economy. Absolutely. So the German national election was held on Sunday, September 26th. Can you explain to us sort of the sentiment in Germany leading up to this election? Um, well, sentiment was partly one of boredom, I must say, because um, there were three candidates uh, from the main um, parties um, and essentially none of them inspired um, much support in the population. And so there have been comments about this being, um, you know, a dreadful choice among, you know, between three very uninspiring and uncharismatic candidates. Um, and I suppose one reason is that the previous government has been led by the same person, Ms. Merkel, uh, for 16 years. She's not anymore, um, you know, she didn't um, stand for a chancellor uh, as a candidate. And so 
because her policy had been aimed, certainly in her own party, to get rid of any potential charismatic challenger. Her own party, which you know used to be for many, many years the biggest party in Germany, um, has been essentially losing a lot of support because anyone who had a bit of uh, charisma um, would disappear. Um, there was 10 years ago a very, very charismatic politician, um, Baron Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg, um, and you know a scandal came about and he was sent into exile. The candidates that uh, were now standing for this election on Sunday really didn't inspire uh, much support uh, from anyone. So that was one of the challenges in this election. So bring us up to date on what's happening right now. There seems to be some confusion as to who is going to be serving as the next chancellor of Germany. Uh, yes, that's not yet decided because essentially no p single party won an absolute majority. And that means, as very often in, in post-war German politics, um, several parties have to get together and form a coalition. In some countries like the UK, this is very rare because they have a different system, first past the post system, where uh, essentially you get much bigger landslide victories for, for one side. Whereas in Germany, it's proportional representation. And so you very often have a lot of parties and none has enough uh, votes on their own. So they have to get together and form a coalition. So what's happening at the moment is there are big discussions behind closed doors. Um, and actually, you could wonder, is this democratic? Because really, the politicians are now making deals. Um, you know, this party with that one, maybe that one with that one. And how about this combination? This is what's happening. And then whatever combination um, works, and if they play their cards well, they might be able to then uh, put forward uh, a candidate for chancellor, and then they will form the government. And it's horse trading, you know, who's going to be finance minister and which party can 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 send their guy to become the foreign minister and, and so on. This is the sort of horse trading that's happening now, which is really, um, I mean, you know, it's, it's not transparent and you could say it's not really democratic, but that's one of the drawbacks of this uh, proportional representation type of uh, election system. So what I really want to talk to you about here is how this election could possibly impact the economy. You have said to me in the past that one of Germany's strengths is the fact that it has many small banks compared to other countries in Europe. So how could this election potentially impact the economy and the lives of ordinary German citizens? All right. Well, there's a number of, of issues where the parties um, have differing views and that there could be an impact. Um, the Green Party, for instance, has uh, somewhat more radical proposals to get rid of um, combustion engine cars. And of course, um, you know, that's been really post-war, in the post-war era, one of the central and, and leading uh, industries in Germany and, and hundreds of thousands of jobs uh, in big companies and small subcontractors are really dependent on the automobile industry. But that could be ending if essentially everything is switched to electric cars. And then because we don't have enough electricity for everyone, we're going to have rationing and only the Politburo members then are allowed to go around in cars and the rest has to use public transport. We could see more public investment in public transport. The Greens um, actually did gain around 50 seats. Um, they're still not a very large party, but they had a, a big win. And therefore, they could be part of a coalition and therefore their green policies could um, become influential and that certainly would affect the economy. But you mentioned the banking system and and in fact, overall economic growth uh, very much depends uh, on the banking system and monetary policies. Now, they are not made by the government. Monetary policies have been taken out of the hands of the government um, a long time ago. and. They're presently, for the last 20 years, in the hands, they've been in the hands of the ECB, the European Central Bank. Now, the ECB has run a regime of um, anti-bank policies, which means also anti-growth policies. And also central banks have, in recent years, increasingly talked about climate issues being very important, which, again, could only really, and in their interpretation, mean let's have less growth. 
Uh, and of course, as they're killing banks, and the ECB has killed around 5,000 banks uh, since it you know, um, started its business 20 years ago. Um, with fewer banks, there will be less economic growth because there'll be fewer lending to small firms and they're really the job creators and they deliver economic growth. Um, so we're likely to have overall as a, as a trend less growth. Um, and that seems to be justified by this narrative that this is good for the climate. I mean, my view is that my analysis says that growth itself doesn't hurt the climate or the environment. Um, because growth is really is really neutral, harmful, environmentally harmful um, activity hurts the environment. And you can have that at zero growth or at high growth. So growth itself is not the problem. It's the type of activity you have, whether it's harmful or not, and that can be adjusted. So you can have very high growth that is um, that is sustainable and does not really damage the environment. So growth is not the enemy. But it seems that some decision makers at, at the central banks don't see it that way. And we've seen a lot of anti-growth policies and Germany is likely to suffer from that. Now, in the short term, just looking at the recent data, bank lending in Germany is still going reasonably strong. Uh, but that could change when central banks um, tighten. Of course, we had some dramatic expansionary policies since last year. And so we, we, we need to watch this carefully. But overall, Germany is really uh, a focus of uh, central bank attention because it has the largest number of banks, mostly small banks lending to small firms. That's the, uh, the strength of the German economy. And that clearly is threatened by the ECB's policies of killing small banks. Now, why would the ECB want to destroy smaller banks? Well, I mean, you could have many theories, and of course, we can never know for sure what, what's really in the mind of these um, central bankers. But there are some uh, political economy uh, theories about this. There's the theory of bureaucracy, and clearly central banking, you know, is a, is a big central planning operation that clearly is a bureaucracy. And the theory of bureaucracy says that any bureaucracy um, ultimately will strive to have more power, and it will do anything to increase its own power, and that becomes more or less the main purpose, not perhaps what the official policies were meant to be. So it becomes more about increasing power. And of course, we had the problem that with central banks that they've been given more and more power in the last 50 years. And whenever there's a crisis, the response seems to be, oh, there's a crisis. Well, let's give the central banks more power. And so each time there's a crisis, they get more power. Now, nobody seems to ask the question, well, who's actually responsible for these crises? And it turns out, oh, it's the central banks. So therefore, we have regulatory moral hazard. The central banks have actually an incentive to create more crises because they will be given more powers. So that could be one explanation that, you know, they're, they're just increasing, trying to increase their power. And of course, if you reduce the number of banks, that makes the central bank even more powerful. And if you go to the extreme and you've killed all the banks, maybe through things like the central banks stepping into the arena and offering competing products that compete against the banks, such as current accounts, which they will call something so you don't recognize it, like CBDC, central bank digital currency. Um, anyway, so as you as you compete away the banks, the central banks become more powerful. And in the in the limit, it will be a Soviet system with one um, central bank. And perhaps they like that. We don't know. Um, hopefully not. Hopefully that's um, that's not really what's happening. Uh, but certainly that would be one consistent explanation. Professor Werner, you mentioned that one of the most successful industries in Germany is the automobile industry. So can you elaborate further on how this particular industry can be impacted by the results of this election? Yes, well, it will depend on what type of coalition government will be formed. And, you know, there's, there's various combinations possible. It could be um, similar to the the, the current government or the outgoing government, which is the Social Democratic Party and the Conservatives together. But it is likely that um, one of the two, or perhaps even both of the smaller parties, the Greens namely, and the Liberal Democratic Party could also join some coalition. In fact, they could then drop one of the big ones. Um, so Merkel's party, the Conservatives could drop out, CDU, CSU, a party could drop out and then it would be the Social Democratic Party together with, for instance, the Green and the Liberal Democratic Party. 
uh, or the other way around. So various combinations are possible. Um, the Greens could well be uh, part of a, a new government. Um, one reason is that they gained a lot of seats. Um, so politicians could could value that, you know, it's a growing movement. So they might want to have that on board in a coalition. And um, that could mean, therefore, that even though it's a small party, they could have a bit of an influence on economic policy, including on things that would directly affect the automobile industry. Um, and that would, uh, for instance, um, include policies about combustion engines. You know, how long will we be allowed to have cars that uh, burn fossil fuels? Um, there is, of course, already an EU um, target for this to essentially end the production or the, the sales of uh, combustion, combustion engine cars by 2030. I think there's also a UN target 2030. Um, and certainly the Green Party will insist that these sort of targets and goals will be met and that will have a significant ripple on effect um, on many industries. But it's ironic that the, the alternative that's presented to us, namely electric cars, you know, it's not really a proper solution because if everyone that has currently um, a car running on, on petrol or diesel um, switch to electric cars, we know, I mean, certainly for the whole world, we do not have enough electricity um, to run all these cars. So what would happen then? And so um, we're therefore also likely to see greater investment in um, public transport infrastructure. Um, certainly China has shown the world how much can be done and they've built in the last uh, 20 years a uh, most amazing uh, system of public transport with uh, rapid uh, train connections across these vast um, distances that, that make up the, the Chinese uh, country. Um, and so public investment needs to be funded so that adds to public debt and that's where we're back to this the link between fiscal policy and monetary policy um, due to the COVID um, policies that were introduced since March last year um, a lot of the countries have now dramatically more public debt and that could well be a problem because um, it seems okay when we have very low interest rates and in Europe actually negative the ECB has introduced negative interest rates and for many countries um, the bond yields are negative now this makes life easy if you're working for the government or the, the Ministry of Finance in the debt um, uh, issuance department and you're issuing government bonds because normally you're supposed to pay dividends or well, coupons on your on the bonds that are being issued like in, in the US, the treasuries. But in Europe, um, actually, there's a negative yield. So you borrow money and you get paid from the investors every year instead of paying them an interest rate. You get an interest rate. So life has been super easy for a lot of European governments. Um, but that's something that cannot continue forever. And so um, once that ends and interest rates rise and of course presently there's a lot of talk about the risk of interest rate rises uh, well then public finance will look drastically um, more um, risky and difficult for many european countries uh, just thinking of italy um, which has a lot of public debt and uh, it may just scrape through at these low interest rates and negative interest rates but if interest rates normalize then um, there will be likely a fiscal crisis. Um, but then on the other hand, we have also on the monetary policy side, a bit of a crisis because inflation has now appeared. And that's in fact a big topic, particularly in Germany, because historically people are very, very sensitive about inflation. Um, and actually now inflation um, has exceeded some of the targets set by the central banks. Why is inflation such a sensitive topic in Germany? Well, you see, 100 years ago, almost exactly 100 years ago, um, there was the beginnings of inflation 
and that turned into high inflation and that turned into hyperinflation. In fact, it was one of the most dramatic periods of inflation the world has ever seen. And that happened in Germany. Um, hyperinflation, galloping inflation, um, so much so that just to buy a loaf of bread, you had to literally um, pay in billions of, uh, of marks, Deutsche Marks, you know, the, the currency in Germany. So that cost billions. And people were just carting around in, in wheelbarrows, packets of banknotes. Each one was one billion or one trillion marks and huge packets. And that's what you needed to just buy anything. So it was a completely um, ridiculous system of hyperinflation. And of course, that does a few things when you have hyperinflation. One thing that governments like about it is that it more or less deletes national debt. And we've just mentioned that actually national debt has increased a lot and it's, it's going to be a problem. But one solution in inverted commas could be to have hyperinflation because then the national debt will be worth nothing. It's gone. But, you know, this means somebody's paying for this. Who's paying for this? For ordinary people. They will be essentially um, expropriated. A lot of people, certainly anyone who has cash will lose their money because it will lose its purchasing power. And that's also why people have been looking for um, assets, real assets that don't lose their value. That's why in Germany, it's one of the reasons we have a bit of a property bubble and property prices have been rising significantly. That's likely to continue as inflation um, picks up. Um, otherwise, you'd buy gold and perhaps also the cryptocurrencies um, have benefited from these uh, fears and, and they're not they're not irrational these fears that you know we could get um, higher inflation it's still early stages uh, we're not yet at a high inflation or certainly not a hyperinflation situation but we've had a lot many years of deflation and this is clearly ending now now we have positive inflation and even ahead of uh, people's forecasts and therefore that's what a lot of people are concerned about and that really strikes a raw nerve in Germany in particular. Professor, you have been an outspoken critic against central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. Can you explain to us why you are so critical of this monetary tool? Right, well, what does it actually mean? CBDC stands for Central Bank Digital Currency. Now, this gives the impression that it's a new thing and so far we haven't been using digital currencies. And that's actually wrong. We've been using digital currencies for decades, um, but they were not issued by central banks. They were issued by the banks. So really what we have been using is BDCs, you know, bank digital currencies. And what's now happening is that the central banks want to move in on the act. They're not really supposed to do that because they're the regulators of the banks and they're supposed to stay neutral like an umpire in a, in a sports game. The umpire is not supposed to join the game and then, you know, try to win while dishing out red cards and yellow cards and whatever. I mean, that would be a very unfair game. But this is really what the central banks seem to be um, mulling over at the moment as they prepare to issue their own digital currency and therefore compete directly with the banks. Now, really, what are they, these digital currencies? Well, they're simply accounts at the central bank. It's if you and me could have an account at the central bank if we're in Europe at the ECB, and it would be like a current account, a checking account. And of course, if you then have a bit of a banking crisis, well, all the money is going to move from the banks to the central banks and the banks will be finished. And then you only have the central bank left. And so that's, that's one of the problems with this. So there is actually a problem from a perspective of competition policy. You know, this is not fair competition. And really the uh, competition um, authorities should step in and say, stop, you know, we can't have the regulator um, dominating a market and driving out all the market players. That's one problem. But the other problem is that when you look at the capacity and capabilities of these CBDCs, you realize that they're definitely more than just currencies. You could say they are not even currencies, they're control tools. Because um, as the head of the BIS um, actually put it quite aptly, when you're using cash, we, he says, we as a central banker, we don't know what you're spending the money on. But when you're using our CBDC, 
we will know what you're going to buy, what, what you're spending the money on, and we can intervene and stop you from buying something or switch you off entirely. I mean, he didn't quite say that, but you get my point. <laughs> that was the gist of the message. And that is, of course, the biggest problem, that it's very much a dystopian totalitarian control tool. And we know human nature. I mean, I'm not saying that necessarily that's what they're aiming at, but we know what human nature is like. And essentially, um, as Lord Acton put it, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. If you give too many powers to a small number of central planners, then they're likely to succumb to the temptation um, and actually use that power. Uh, but that's that would create a fairly totalitarian system. So we have to be very careful with this. Well, what about other cryptocurrencies, in particular the decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin? Say if there were to be some sort of CBDC monetary system fully implemented, do you think that these other decentralized cryptocurrencies would still be able to exist? They're likely going to be measures against them by that stage. Um, so at the moment, they look like an alternative, and I think they will see uh, you know, even more um, you know, spotlights on them, and I think some of them will do very well in the short term. But in the long run, the central bankers are not likely to be happy with them being around as competition, and that means there are likely to be laws against that. Um, there's going to be attempts to outlaw them that could be quite drastic. And once the banks have been decimated, then um, it would be feasible for the central banks to ensure that they have the monopoly power with their own digital control tool. How can we stop this from happening? It seems like we are potentially headed down a very dark pathway. What do you suggest people do to ensure that we don't head towards a system of complete totalitarian control? I think one, one important activity is to spread the news and tell everyone what this is about and warn people. Because as more people realize what this is about, then we can mobilize um, alternatives to this. And secondly, yes, we should do the opposite. And that is we should try to decentralize the monetary system. So cryptocurrencies could be one avenue. But as I said, I mean, by the nature of, of this um, of, of cryptocurrencies, they could also be abolished and there could be measures against them. Um, in many countries, there are small banks and community banks. And I think what we should do is we should increase their numbers because there's, they're part of the present system. You can't really um, abolish them um, immediately with legal steps. You know, it will be through this unfair competition that they're going to work against them. But if the public chooses to support their community banks, then um, that will be a viable, very decentralized alternative. And of course, local community banks could even be used, you know, to move one step further and then issue local currencies that could be linked to um, local authorities, tax revenues and things like that. So all sorts of schemes will be possible that will be decentralized, local, small scale. And as long as they're supported by the local communities, um, could be quite successful. All right, Professor Richard Werner, always great to speak with you. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. And I want to thank you all for watching this video. If you would like to stay up to date with Professor Werner's work, you can follow him on social media at Professor Werner. And you can also visit his website, professorwerner.org.